handles the social media. So I think we're good to start now. Uh, it's seven on the dot. Okay. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to be here today. Um, we would like to begin today's session with a land acknowledgement. So the Decolonized Library Project and its executive committee is physically situated on the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples in Toronto, Canada. And we're so thankful to the original inheritors of this earth for allowing us to exist and practice our praxis on this land. Um, we are so grateful to have the opportunity to listen to Dr. Prabhjot today, albeit virtually while being in different cities and countries. Um, but before we begin, we would like to sincerely thank all the graduate and undergraduate students, the community members and respected academics and scholar activists for encouraging us to build this platform in the wake of the global pandemic. Um, and before we invite you to speak, we just wanted to introduce ourselves as the hosts of today's program um, and the executive directors of the Decolonized Library Project. So my name is Shifa. I'm a global coordinator at an international NGO headquartered out of Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I'm a graduate of Laurier's MA in Religion and Culture and Global, just, uh, global Justice, just like Fatma and Kiran. And my interests include studying the theological underpinnings of so, social and environmental justice movements. I'm so proud of being, um, it's proud to be one of the executive directors of the Decolonized Library Project. Um, hi, my name is Fatima. Uh, I'm currently a research assistant uh, through Wilfrid Laurier University, where I got my MA along Shifan Kiran. Um, my research interests are usually along the lines of Shia revolutionary thought, the epistemologies of justice, and Quranic hermeneutics. Um, so being part of the DLP is very, very exciting. My name is Kiran. I'm a PhD student at York University here in Toronto and one of the other executive directors for DLP. Um, my doctoral work centers around topics in post-secularism, post-colonialism, and ideas in epistemic injustice. Um, so by relying on spiritual frameworks and the conceptions of uh, liberation, I tend to think of the idea of sovereignty in the place of spirituality in uh, modern quote-unquote post-secular societies. Uh, so as educators with stu students ourselves, we felt the weight of mobilizing knowledge in this new and changing world. Uh, we decided to create a platform uh, that amplifies the space for dialogue and discussion around the role of religion and decolonization within marginalized public life. So our intention is to build connections between community and identity by considering the intricate ways in which they intersect, particularly what these intersections can teach us about mutual aid and potential and potential interfaith conversations. So this kind of discourse becomes pertinent both locally and internationally as we think through decolonization and liberation from oppressive social and systemic structures. Um, we're animated by the spirit of authentic community building, information sharing, and revolutionary mind mapping. The DLP strives to be an initiative that encourages faith-rooted activism and modes of being that seek freedom from the stark colonial realities that permeate, permeate our daily lives. Today we're, we've uh, gathered to discuss the farmers' protests and historically the social justice uh, advocacy of the Sikh Gurus was focused on religious discrimination. Uh, however, today in the contemporary landscape of neoliberal quote-unquote secular dem democracies like India, that ag advocacy has taken on a different character. As we know, the farm bills introduced in India have taken away the economic protection for the farmers to secure rightful livelihood. Uh, this in turn has led to farmers to state uh, from the, across the state to march on peaceful protests towards the nation's capital, Delhi. Uh, there's been a resistance from farmers around the country to three undemocratically passed farm laws that were approved without public consent during the pandemic in India. These farm laws exploit the already suffering farmers' agricultural situation and takes away their protection from large capitalist uh, companies that would no longer have to abide by the minimum support price. Uh, so since the supposed uh, quote unquote secular democratic nation of India has taken part in human rights violations committed against the peaceful protesters, activists have been jailed and raped, uh, international doctors working on the protest sites have been assaulted and countless threats have been made to the farmers for practicing their democratic rights. Uh, farmers ac have actually in turn opened up their own grocery huts, uh, planted gardens, created libraries, schools, and continue to serve Langar, all of which is open to the slum population of Delhi. So we wanted to welcome Dr. Prabhjot Singh, who is an educator and activist situated in 
San Jose, California, um, who specializes in leadership. Dr. Singh has recently become an essential force in providing educational resources on the research, recent farmers' protests taking place in India during the COVID-19 pandemic. The protest has now become one of the largest in human history, making it absolutely vital that our communities stay informed and active. In this particular lecture, Dr. Singh will expand on his insights regarding the dire situation and how to proceed. So uh, Dr. Singh, perhaps it would be useful to prime the discussion with a prompt on the expansion of the history behind the protests of the six in the Indian state. Um, how would you say that this struggle from the past also persists today? And so sure. Uh, number one, thank you for having me. Uh, this is a great um, undertaking of this whole decolonized library project that you guys are doing. Um, that's number one. Um, number two, we're talking about the farmers' protests specifically. Just briefly, I'll go into the background of what exactly is happening. The farmers are now at the gates of Delhi, which is the capital city of India, because they are protesting three farmer bills, which essentially, over time, in the span of a few years, will take away their rights, will take away their ability to negotiate, and force them into so much debt that they're forced to sell their land to get out of that debt. They'll be selling their land to billionaire corporations, billionaires, which are vested in these three pharma bills being passed. So if we talk about the billionaires, we talk about Mukesh Ambani, we talk about Gautam Adani, we're talking about the billionaires from India, which have used their leverage with the prime minister of India which is who is Narendra Modi, and they are forcing these former bills through parliament. If we look at the video of how these bills were passed through parliament, there was a wide array of no's through parliament saying, we don't approve of this bill, but forcefully it was approved. Now we talk about, are these just rumors that billionaires are behind this? The Adanis and Ambanis have large silos within Punjab, within farming regions that are equipped to handle hundreds of tons, hundreds of metric tons of crop, of grain. So they're already in existence. They're essentially waiting for these farm bills to be passed, waiting for the farmers to get kicked off their land, and they're gonna store those crops, hold them in these silos, and then sell them kind of at a, at a market rate or above market rate, because they have it in with the government, and the government can kind of, you know, loosen or tighten restrictions at their discretion. So another factor to look at, the farmers in India, so India is situated in a way where 60% of the population is agriculture is their primary economy, agriculture is their primary livelihood. So out of that 60%, a large part of farming happens in the Northern region of what is currently occupied by India, and that is in Punjab. Now, Punjab was very large prior to the farmers, uh, prior to the farmers protest, prior to partition. Half of Punjab was in Pakistan, half of Punjab is in what is now uh, India. So at partition, Punjab was split in half. Now, out of what was left of Punjab, India cut out Haryana, which is a state, and they cut out Himachal Pradesh, which is another state. So they reduced the land of Punjab, whatever was existent within India, from about 60,000 square miles to about 20,000 square miles. So they've crippled it in that way, making it very small. So when we talk about farmers and we talk about farmers protest, a majority of them come from Punjab and Haryana, which was also Punjab. So Punjab and Haryana are essentially kind of, they're together. Until 66, they were together. So the people that are currently in charge, the farmer union leaders, sat in front of the barricades in November of 2020. And they said, this is adequate protest. The people of Punjab were not so happy with that decision. The people of Punjab decided to march through the barricades. They decided to take whatever tear gas and water cannons that were coming their way, and they made it to the streets of Delhi, to the gates of Delhi, to the borders. And then the farmer union leaders came a couple days later, they joined. And then they said, you know, since this is a farming issue, 
will give you the leadership. So unfortunately, today we're seeing farm and union leaders saying, you know, we set this whole thing up, which couldn't be farther from the truth. The people that set this up, the people that initiated this whole thing are now in jail or they're banned from the stage. So that's kind of an internal political thing happening within the farmers protest. But when we talk about the government of India and we talk about um, kind of them as a democracy, I think it's the furthest thing from a democracy. And I think it's been the furthest thing for, from a democracy since inception, since 1947. So in 1947, India declares independence. Who is known as the father of Indian independence? Gandhi. Even though there were 80% of the lives sacrificed for Indian independence were six. 80% of those that served life imprisonments were six even though they were at that point 1.1 to 1.2% of the population. So there is an over uh, emphasis and uh, uh, sacrifices that were given from a very small percentage of the population for this cause. But because winners write history and because history is written by those in charge and by the majority, Gandhi is known as the father of Indian independence, even though in South Africa, he was known to be you know, racist, he was known to be uh, subservient to his white masters. Um, but coming to India, he did uh, salt marches and this whole thing. So that is a that is a probably a different topic, but it's exemplifies kind of how media is behind this whole churning of India being a quote unquote democracy, which it is not. So farmers are protesting now in Delhi. We talked about partition. And I think we should talk about the history of Sikhs and their struggle. Sikhs are from a particular, are from the Punjab region of India, which is Indian occupied. I never like to say Punjab is in, in India because I like to say it's Indian occupied. India is occupying that land currently, but there is an active independence movement and the people of Punjab know that they're suppressed. So. It's in Indian uh, occupied Punjab. That's where Sikhs originate from. If you look at the history of Sikhs, the farmers protest is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Sikh resistance. Keep in mind, at this point in time, all of India has joined these protests, but where they were initiated from, if we don't talk about that because it's somehow a taboo or we can't talk about religion or we can't talk about how this whole thing originated, then that is also a disservice. We will be dishonest to how this protest came about. So it wouldn't be unreasonable to say that the six from Punjab, that the people of Punjab set up the largest peaceful protest in human history. They initiated that. When we talk about the history, in the 1700s, they were fighting Mughal oppression. Mughal rulers came into India and they said, these, um, we need you to convert, or um, we kind of occupy your land, we take over your land. During that time, six fought them actively, and they continued to fight them actively until Mughal occupation was no longer in India. Fast forward to British colonization. The, the British people were able to colonize India very quickly. By 1750, India was colonized. But they couldn't penetrate, they couldn't penetrate Punjab for the next 90 to 100 years because Punjab had such a strong, when we talk about Kalsaraj, when we talk about um, a Sikh kingdom, now the term is Khalistan. But when we talk about a Sikh kingdom, when we talk about Kalsaraj, these three terms are not exclusive. Sikh, Sikh kingdom, Khalistan, and uh, Kalsaraj, they're not different. They're not separate. There's different terms for different eras, but they're all together. So when six had that version of Khalistan back then, they set up such a strong opposition to British colonization that the British were unable to penetrate. Um, in, the, in the research, in the history books, there's a lot of different stories about how they were able to penetrate, but we know that Maharaja Dalip Singh, which was Maharaja Ranjit Singh's son, was 
taken to British. He was basically, um, sorry, Britain. He was a captive of Britain. He still has, there's still his castle in Britain. There's still jewels of Maharani Jindakar, which was Dalip Singh's mother and Maharaja Ranji Singh's wife. There's still their uh, symbols. There's still parts of them left in Britain. But they were taken and it was a whole divide and conquer type situation. So after Punjab gets colonized, again, six, we talk about Bhagat Singh, Udham Singh's, uh, Udham Singh's, we remember Udham Singh a couple of days ago as the man that assassinated General Dyer, who was the man who caused Jalliawala Bagh, where hundreds of people were massacred, six, again, hundreds of six were massacred. Because even during that time, there was an uprising between six saying that, we cannot live under this type of oppression. We can't live suppressed. So they were, there was an active movement against the British colonizers of the time. So there was that. And then Bhagat Singh fights British oppression. He is symbolic. He sets off a symbolic bomb in the Lahore conference where he then gets arrested and Actually, in the history books, it's indicated that Gandhi, being a lawyer, could have easily freed Bhagat Singh because what he, the symbolic gesture that he did caused no casualties. But again, uh, Gandhi chose not to because if Bhagat Singh would have gotten out of prison, he would have been the face of Indian independence. And that's not just something that they could manage. So Bhagat Singh was hung. So we, we talk about from the Mughals hundreds of years ago to the British a hundred years ago to now um, the farmers protest resistance. When we talk about 1984 and we talk about um, the Indian media painting six as violent, showing that they had weaponry and somehow they're violent. Even right now they have weaponry. Even right now the people at the front lines um, in the farmers protest have weaponry, but they're saying, you know, we're sitting here until we get attacked. If we get attacked, then you better watch out, but you have no reason to fear us. And the people of India, for the most part, understand this. But when the Indian media is successful in painting them as violent terrorists, it's just a replay of what we had in 1984. These farmers' protests started back then, in the late 70s, in the early 80s, when they were saying taxation for the farmers should be wiped out. Farmers should be able to buy machinery at this rate. We talk about the Green Revolution, a very, it wasn't green, it wasn't a revolution, it was very oppressive and it forced the farmers to, uh, to over rely kind of on their resources, ramifications which we're seeing today. The waters that we're seeing today, the water depletion in Punjab, saying that in the next 10 to 15 years, Punjab can turn into a desert because they were so busy being labeled the breadbasket of India and feeding the country that even though they have rivers, Punjab means the land of five rivers five rivers. Panj means five, Ab means water. So Punjab literally has water in its name. And those farmers, that state has no rights over its own water. It's the only state in the country that has no riparian rights. So that state is now being forced to dig underground, deplete their underground water supply. These farmers are digging two, 300 feet into the ground, getting water from underground, even though they have rivers running in the state. So this is kind of how they have been feeding the country is by reducing their own resources. So once it turns into a desert and they have no rights over their own waters, then farming is going to move to a different region of the country anticipated, whatever that might look like in the future. So when we talk about the farmers protest and we talk about the three farmer bills, these farmers were not in a good position before the three farmer bills. They'll be in an even worse position after the three farmer bills. But again, it is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Indian oppression, when it comes to Indian media painting a story in a certain way, when it comes to six and fighting oppression. Um, the people that died in 84 through 95 fighting for the right causes, they didn't die because they expected to see uh, the effects of their resistance right away. They died for us to even be 
part of these farmer protests. They died for the farmers that are currently on the streets of Delhi, the elders that are saying, we may die on these streets, but these bills are gonna kill us anyways. So we might as well die fighting. And this has always been the Sikh spirit. This has always been their spirit of resistance. And we talk about, you know, the Indian government tries to label farmers as uneducated. They try to say that, you know, these people don't know what's going on, but somehow they were able to, you know, get this in the attention of the, of the diaspora, of the UK's, the Canada's, the US's, where senators, where congressmen, where MPs are talking about the farmers' protest. They're talking about India not being a democracy. Now, a lot of countries are muzzling themselves for fear that India may cut ties with them or that India may, you know, give them some sort of ramifications, which is what we're seeing in Canada. The Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, didn't even say anything anti-India. He just said, we stand with the farmers' rights to protest peacefully. And because of that, the Indian ambassador called Justin Trudeau and said, there will be ramifications for you making this statement. Now, if saying that you should allow people to protest peacefully, and if saying that you should have the freedom of speech is cause, is warrant for ramifications from a country, what does that tell you about the country? They're operating under the guise of democracy and they're getting all this foreign funding under the guise of democracy. I've always said, if anyone tells you sitting in Australia or the UK or Thailand or any, anywhere in the world, why should we care about the farmers protest? Well, if you have a Facebook, if you have an Instagram, if you have a Twitter, if you have any of these social media platforms, all of these are very, very much corrupted by the Indian narrative. So you will be getting suppressed if you're, raising a, if you're raising awareness about this. So if you have an Instagram, this affects you. If you have a Facebook, the content that you post can be censored, can be limited by the Indian government. So beyond a food standpoint, even your social voice is muzzled. If you wanna talk about anything besides your breakfast or about your selfie or that cool new outfit you got, if you want to talk about anything besides that, just know that it can be censored and it will be because of India and it will be because of the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Sundar Pichais, which are the Google CEOs, funding and giving money to the Indias and then being forced to muzzle a voice which is talking about the truth of India. So it's not illogical what they're doing, but it is very evident what's happening and it is evident that it affects you so i don't know if i answered your question Kiran, uh, but you can move on to the next question and let me know if there's anything i missed um, that was quite extensive thank you so much for that i mean uh, it's no secret that um, there are also many individuals that are participating in these protests that associate with different faiths uh, so we know that the indian state is home to many religious minorities that are often uh, mistreated and underrepresented in the in its political affairs. Um, as we know, Sikhs, Jains, and Buddhists are all bracketed to be Hindus under the Hindu personal law uh, within the Indian constitution itself. And we all obviously know that this this uh, denies them the religious autonomy that uh, to be a distinct religion. So uh, we know that there's dis uh, serious discrepancies in terms of the constitutional assertions and then the lived realities in India. Uh, including the rampant issue of Islamophobia towards its Muslim population as well. Uh, th this much is uh, quite clear. So Dr. Singh, if you could tell us, you know, exactly how important religion is uh, in the context of this Morcha, these protests, and, and maybe even what it tells us about Sikhi and uh, the nature of these protests, what we're seeing on the ground. Um, it, it, we know that on social media, we've seen a few of uh, the, the Muslim population coming forward and saying that we stand with the Kassans, we stand with the farmers. Um, so it does seem like religion, um, while it might be an issue uh, that the Hindutva regime is trying to push forward as uh, anti-Hindu, um, it's not entirely uh, true to the, the actual narrative that's on the ground. So if you'd like to elaborate a little bit on that as well. Sure, yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. If we look at the patterns of what is happening during the farmers protest, it's nothing new to India. In Kashmir, they had 
a internet lockdown where the people of Kashmir were not even able to bid on their own land because there was no internet. You couldn't call, you know, across the state. The phone lines were down. So this is how India has run. They, they run, again, under the guise of a democracy. They do these internet shutdowns for indefinite periods of time to operate as invisibility cloaks for them to commit atrocities and not let the world hear about it. So the fact that we're talking about Kashmir, the, the fact that we're talking about Indian oppression happening there specifically is a testament to media and information being circulated. Unfortunately, the forces we're up against are huge. The billionaires and the resources we're up against are huge. So we are seeing our voices actively suppressed, but it's nothing new. You have a member of the Modi regime right now saying that Muslims aren't equal. He said, there are equal rights if you're an equal. And then the interviewer asked him, are Muslims equal? And he says, no, Muslims are not equal. So within itself, within the Indian governance system, they're creating divides. And I'll tell you exactly why they create divides. The Indian government runs based on a divisive governance method. They run on a caste system. They run saying that these families are the elites, the Brahmins. Then there's the warrior class. Then there's another class. Then there's the untouchables. And when we get to the farmers protest, we see that Sikhi doesn't believe in that. Number one, Sikhi doesn't believe in uh, a caste system. Number two, Sikhi doesn't believe in inequality of different people. So when we have these marginalized populations, we have the, un, uh, the quote unquote low caste untouchable population of India now being given the opportunity to sit with everyone else, to be fed with everyone else, to get schooling for the first time in their life. They're seeing this as they're like, we don't ever want these people to leave. We, we hope that the farmers protests continue forever because all we've seen in our life is subjugation. All we've seen in our life is outcast. You are outcast because you are of a low caste. So bringing it back to religion, religion is divisive if you follow the Indian government's narrative. Religion is not divisive on the ground itself. Religion is a part of their everyday life. You can't say don't involve religion. The Sikh flag, the Nishan side. There's union leaders right now saying this flag shouldn't be here. Don't make this religious. Well, how are you going to remove religion from a community, from a population who's down to the molecular level are religious? Everything they do is religious. They start their day with a prayer. They end their day with a prayer. Midday, there's a prayer. So you can't say don't be religious to a, a, to a population that is religious by nature. So that's number one. Number two, when we talk about Sikhi and we talk about um, the farmers protesting from Punjab down to Delhi, they've never been about our thinking is superior to yours. If someone else is going to pray there, they say you have full rights to pray there. When we talk about a democracy, that is Sikhi to its core. When we talk about equality, yes, in Punjab, because of the influence of the country that they're living in, there are divides. They're saying this part of the village is for the lower caste. This part of the people of villages for the higher caste. But that is not Sikhi. That is not the faith. That is not the religion. That is the people's thinking, which has been polluted, which has been contaminated by the region that they live in. So they're living in a region that believes in the caste system. If you look at Guru Nanak Dev Ji, when he set up Langa, Langa is the Sikh institution of feeding everyone, regardless of caste or creed. If you look, he was born in 1469, so late 1400s, in a region where there is a clear divide between who is upper caste, who is lower caste, who's a king and who's untouchable. He said, no, everyone sits at the same place. Everyone gets the same food and we are equals. So at that time, when we talk about revolutionaries, we don't talk about Guru Nanak Dev Ji, but he was perhaps the biggest revolutionary of all time. He said that everyone is equal and equality at that time, and even now actually in India, is a revolutionary thought and people are getting jailed 
for equality. And people are getting, you know, muzzled and silenced because they are talking about equality. So when we talk about the farmers protest and we talk about the farmers that are there, there is no discrimination between faith and not. Actually, faith and that supreme belief is what is uniting everyone. But again, because of how India has ran for since inception, since 1947, and even before that, when we talk about the, the inclination and the overemphasis on the caste system, this is how India has ran. And in 1947, it amplified that more, exacerbated it more, because now it didn't just become, uh, it, didn't, it wasn't just a thought, it wasn't just a faith, now it became a system of governance. And when it became a system of governance, then oppression and suppression is kind of what comes with that system of governance. So that in itself is antithetical to, to democracy. You cannot be a democracy and say that these people are the leaders and these people are the fighters and these people are untouchables. So it took the farmers' protest to bring these issues to the limelight. And even now, the battle is uphill. Even now, it's you have to fight tooth and nail to even get your point across. There's people being jailed right now, and we're celebrating their release. We're saying, wow, I'm so glad that XYZ got bail. I'm so glad that XYZ got bail from this jail, or she was a female, or he was a male. They were of different face, but I'm glad they got bail. What we fail to recognize is what is the system that jailed them in the first place? They did nothing wrong. Why do they need to get bailed out? Yes, I agree it's better for them to be out of jail than in jail, but what is it that put them in jail to begin with? What kind of system is it that put them in jail to begin with? That is what we need to focus on. And the voices that we're talking about that, the deep Siddhus, um, these people are in jail. Palwinder Singh Talwada is in jail. Lakha Sadana was banned from speaking on the farmer stage because he openly said, when India sends us to the borders of Pakistan and China and tells us to risk our lives, six Sardars, tells us to risk our, risk our lives for India's protection, at that point, we're heroes. At that point, these are our brave Sikh brothers that are fighting for our protection. But the moment they start to say, hey, these farmer bills are going to kick our livelihood out, they're not given that same respect. So we see the abusive uh, nature in which the Indian government runs, in that you're only useful to us in a very, very specific way. Anything above and beyond that, you're problematic to us. So Sikhs need to realize this in the diaspora. The people of the world need to realize what kind of suppressive regime India is, and especially the people in Punjab need to recognize this. I have family in Punjab that's saying, you know, there's nothing wrong. There's only a few thousand people at the protest. And the reason they're saying that is because the Indian media and the Indian government has so many resources, is so powerful. We're talking about Mukesh Ambani, the man that is one of the billionaires who was set to benefit a lot from these farmer bills. He owns the Network 18 group, which has a viewership of 700 million people. Now, if you're able to influence the thinking of 700 million people because of what you write or because of what you show on TV, then you have all the power. You get to kind of set the narrative, which is why the population of Punjab actually has forgotten all of the things that have happened in the history of Punjab, recent history. I was reading a report today about a man that was killed, uh, Kashmir Singh, in 1997. That was 24 years ago. I was alive when he was picked up by the Indian government and killed. So the Indian government has actively tried to suppress all of the operations, all of the different things that it's taken, all of the drug infestation that they've put in Punjab to suppress the generation, all of the sexual assaults and rape operations that the Indian government has sanctioned to say that you now get to rape sick women because we've already killed off all their men. We're going from village to village, picking up men that are between 50, 15, and 45, and we're disappearing them, aka killing them. And now there's so many single sick women in Punjab that don't have husbands or brothers or anyone in their lives or fathers to take care of them. Now you get to go and um, rape them. And now you get to go ahead and 
change a whole generational makeup of six. And somehow we've justified that. And somehow the people of Punjab have forgotten that. So technically it's not their fault. Technically uh, we shouldn't get upset if they don't remember that. It's our job in the diaspora. Because when you're in the middle of a storm, you kind of don't have perspective of where things are flying. But when you're looking at the storm from outside in, you can see that that person's screwed. And that's kind of how we see the people of India. The general population of India, regardless of religion, regardless of faith, is a brotherhood, is a system that can thrive. It is saying that, you know, even though we're considered untouchables, we see our sick brothers because they acknowledge us as brothers. They see us as brothers. They don't see us as low caste. So it's very uniting. Faith is very uniting there at the farmers' protest. So to discount that, to remove that is a disservice. And I think it will weaken the farmers' protest. And that is the narrative that's been the Indian media has been pushing and the union leadership, which is now at the head of the farmers' protest, has been pushing. And I think that's why we're sitting at a day 103 making zero headway into re repealing the laws. I think that's why we are where we are right now. Thank you, thank you for answering that question. I mean, um, it's, it's no, um, no surprise that the conversation has been secularized in some circles and there's been an effort to separate Sikhi, a very strong effort to se separate Sikhi from the protests. And I, I know that you would agree now that it's extremely misguided because it's the richness of the Sikh religion uh, and its principles of temporal and spiritual power that um, allow us to be sovereigns in our uh, own capacity to deal with the Galpur. Um, so you you touched on censorship a little bit, and I think that that would be uh, an interesting point to revisit. Uh, we know that uh, censorship, especially of Sikh media, of Sikh accounts, continues to be a digital battle that's being fought, obviously, within India, but also uh, the media sources are targeting individuals and organizations from uh, different countries. Uh, so how do you suggest that we, we fight censorship? And, and what is your, your message to the diaspora communities in terms of circulating information as well? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. Censorship is huge because censorship is kind of what allows these things to continue. So when we talk about how to counter censorship, I think it starts from talking about India because the moment you start talking about India and you t the moment you start talking about their oppression in a variety of ways, this type of uh, narrative doesn't need to only be on social media. It can be through art. It can th be through paint. It can be through music. It can be through poetry. It can be through a variety of different mediums. Resistance can happen that way. Native Americans used dance as a resistance and that's why they were banned from dancing. So resistance can come in a variety of ways, but to talk about India and to talk about their reality because the facts and the reality are in the favor of the population. A lot of people have invested in India. A lot of billionaires have invested in India with or without the knowledge that it's an oppressive regime. So once we can bring that to the limelight, once we can go to our town hall meetings, once we can get the attention of our politicians that are you know, in these circles that talk about these issues on the regular, then we can bring these issues to the limelight, perhaps try to take away some of their foreign investments. And that I think would be an effective form of protest. So that's number one. Censorship. India is the biggest violator of internet censorship by far out of all of the countries. If you look at their internet shutdowns, Venezuela was at 12. The next nearest country was at nine for 2020. India was at 120. They had 120 internet shutdowns. And that is just the amount of internet shutdowns. That doesn't talk about the duration. Kashmir has been under an internet shutdown for over a year. So if we talk about days, it's much beyond 120. Why does India need to keep censoring their internet? What are they so afraid of getting out why is it that when rihanna says why aren't we talking about this why aren't we talking about this six words she said six words and it set all of india ablaze because it's now you're talking about 
our country. Now you're talking about our affairs. Greta Thunberg, her pictures are burned in India. So many different celebrities, Hollywood celebrities, um, NFL players, NBA players have talked about this. And the Indian response is always, this is, a, this is an internal affair. Please don't, please don't talk about our internal affairs. Well, if you are stepping on the necks and you are killing and you are sexually assaulting people in prison and you're running under the guise of a democracy and you're saying, we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of religion, but you're openly saying that Muslims are not equal being a religious group. If you're saying that from a government standpoint, then you're not a democracy. From no angle are you a democracy. And again, these issues have surfaced now in 2020, 2021, but in the Sikh community, we've seen these issues arise since inception, since 1947. Sikhs have lived in their own kingdom. They've had a Sikh Raj, they've had a Khalistan, they've had their own kingdom. So to take away sovereignty and to take away and say that now you have to live in a suppressed ma manner, six will die before that happens. Even when there was hundreds of them in jungles, even then they were able to rise. Even then they resisted. The, the captors of the time in the 17, 1800s who were kidnapping women from India and taking them to different countries, six being in the hundreds on the brink of extinction left the jungles and would attack those armies, free those women and deliver those women back to their villages. So you're talking about a culture and a religion and a faith of resistance. So these farmer bills are just the tip of the iceberg. Six have seen this oppression before. So India has never been a democracy. This whole sham of Gandhi and nonviolence and this whole thing, it's starting to surface very, very slowly because there was, there was Gandhi protests here. I mean, a lot of people don't know this about him. A five-time Nobel Peace Prize, Prize, Peace Prize reject is Gandhi. He had a third door opened in Durban where he lived in South Africa for saying that Indians don't get to walk through the same door as white people because white people are superior, but Indians don't want to walk through the same door as black people because Indians are somehow above black people. So he had a third door open for Indians specifically and Indians walked through that. So you're talking about a man that had the caste system and a clear divide from a very young age. He came to India and did a bunch of marches and there was movies made about him because again, that narrative was written by them, but the world doesn't know a lot about who he was. So how does this tie into this? That was 1940s, early 1930s. You know, that was a long time ago. And India has been operating in this suppressive, in this, we get to change the narrative manner for since inception. So the farmers protest, fast forward 100 years to 2021, yes, India is not a democracy. Yes, India is silencing minorities. Yes, India is killing minorities. But this isn't the first time it's happened. And fortunately, the farmers protests and the manner in which things have unfolded have allowed a lot of these things to, to surface. There's a whole conversation around, you know, the Indian flag. Let's talk about the Indian flag. The Indian flag represents oppression, which is why if you're opposing Indian policies, then, I mean, tell that to the victims of 1984, where, you know, they had their people killed by Indian sanctioned pogroms, not riots. They call them 1984 riots. They weren't riots. There was an uprising where people got up and were angry and killed a bunch of Sikhs. Sikh houses were marked with red X's the day before these pogroms started. Sikh addresses were given to mobs to say that this is where Sikhs live. This is where Sikhs own businesses. Go ahead and burn those places. Go ahead and kill the people that you see inside. And then the people that were killed, there's a widow's colony currently in 1984 where there is housing set up for the widows of 1984. The Indian government, after a lot of, um, you know, court cases and a lot of judicial actions has now said that 
these widows have a place to live. We'll give them a job. Shh, don't talk about the 1984 pogroms. This is, an, this is a country that has run this way for decades, since inception. So the farmers protest and 60% of the country being put out of a job because billionaires want to make more money, that's nothing new to India. And this is nothing new to out how India has ran. Fortunately, because of the sick heritage of resistance, because of this kind of being a part of their, even in the, in the British army, six were 1.1% of the population. Um, and they were occupied more than 50% of the British army. So this is kind of what they were bred to do, but it's now up to us to change that narrative to say that we don't get used and abused based on what you need at the time. We are gonna fight for ourselves. So if six can fight the British, if they can fight Mughal occupation, just imagine for, for the rights of not only themselves, but for other people, Imagine what they can do for themselves. The only thing that can hold us back is ourselves. The only thing that can hold ourselves back is to say, don't let the sick flag fly at um, the farmer's protest. Don't talk about religion. Don't bring these elements into it. That's the only thing that can slow us down. The Indian government can't slow us down. And this is something they've realized. And this is something that they're act, frankly very, very afraid of is that we can't slow these people down, so let them slow themselves down. And the only thing that can slow us down is ourselves. So platforms like what you're doing, uh, you're kind of bringing forth a new wave of education, a new form of resistance in that raising awareness and talking about the sham that is India, the hypocrisy of operating under the guide, guise of a democracy, the way that India is running and has run for decades. That is what's brought the farmers' protests. And notice, I'm talking about the farmers' protests a little bit, and I'm talking about Indian history a lot, because you can't separate the two. This is how they've operated for decades, and it's impossible to separate the two, which is why it comes up repetitively. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I think that's been you know, um, quite thorough in what you've been saying. And we have a few questions um, in the chat and in the interest of time, perhaps Shifa, you can read them out uh, for Dr. Prabhjot Singh. Perfect, so I have a question here from, um, and maybe I, I'll leave the name out unless that person messaged me that lets me know to um, read it out. But um, their question is, um, where is the protest heading now? What are your predictions? And a follow-up, what is your image of Punjab post an unsuccessful or successful farmers protest? So two, two pretty big questions there. Number one, I can't answer fully. Um, uh, the question was from Harkiran. She said it was okay to use her name. Um, it's, it's hard to say kind of which direction this is headed in. It's, it's going to be the wolf that we feed is the direction that this protest is headed in. We talk about the marches that were happening just a couple days ago in, um, in Punjab, in India, in support of the political prisoners. And then on the other side, we have the Sonia Mons. We have a different group saying that, you know, we're also um, running our own type of rally. We're also garnering our own support. And this is nothing new. We're seeing this in California. We're seeing this all over the world where there are anti-farmer bill protesters, such as myself, such as a lot of people that are saying that these bills are detrimental. And on the other side, there's pro-India flag rallies happening to garner support for India. Same thing is happening in India right now. So there are people advocating for the right things. And unfortunately, those people are banned and have been banned from speaking on the farmers' protest stage for a long, long time now. When we talk about Deep Siddhu, when we talk about uh, Lakha Sadana, Dr. Sukhpri Singh Odoke, all these people have been banned from speaking on stage at the farmers' protest under the guise of you're going to make this religious or you're going to actually change topic even though everything they say has farmers' rights in it. Everything they say um, talks about how to win the farmers' protests. And these people are not only uh, banned from stage, not only arrested, but they're banned from even going to the meetings. So it's going to be up to us on how much we can pressure the union leadership to involve 
these entities, these figures that have a much more comprehensive image of what's happening on the ground there. Aside, if you look at from before today, farmer union leaders have only been able to gather three, 400 people max. Even when they were barricaded in Punjab, they sat down in front of the barricades. They said, this is our form, or form of protest. It was the people of Punjab that tore the barricades aside, that headed to Delhi. And then they said, okay, the farmer union leaders now came a couple of days later. You guys can get the leadership of these protests because these are farmer specific. But what happened from there was under the fame, under whatever intoxication that they had of now we're at the forefront of the biggest protest in the world. Now you can't speak on stage. Now you can't speak on stage. Now we're actually going to call you a traitor. We're going to call you a traitor. Everyone that went here is a traitor. So there was a lot of missteps that the Kassan Union leadership has taken um, and I, I would argue is continuing to take. So how much pressure can we put on the union leadership to say that we need these people out of jail. We need these people in your meetings, talking to the Modis, talking to the Amit Shahs, talking to the Tomars, who are, you know, your, your authorities on this matter. We need these people talking to them. And only in that way, because again, at 103 days, the Indian government is saying, you know, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. We're not repealing the bills. So clearly we haven't been successful in, in, you know, creating enough pressure. And the one event that was symbolic of protest, it was civil disobedience. It was nonviolent is where the, on the January 26th, the people went to the red fort, which by the way, is not owned by India. They went to the red fort. They planted a farmer's flag. They planted a Nishan side because it was the Nishan side that took them there. That was viewed by Kassan Union leadership as a symbol of being a traitor. And they called the people that went there traitors. And they, and they said, you know, oh, uh, Deep Sidhu led them there. La Kasadana led them there. You can't lead 100,000 people. We have tried to have car rallies here. We can't even control 50 cars. And you're telling me that a one individual can, can lead hundreds of thousands of people there and force them to do something? They went on their own accord. And even then, it was civil disobedience. It was, you know, people occupied. It was, it was a form of protest. It was nonviolent. Because if 100,000 people marched into Delhi with a violent mindset, the whole city would be taken down. But that's not what they did. But again, the Indian media wants to paint it in a certain way. And a lot of people are afraid to say that shouldn't have happened. You gave India an excuse. Just the fact that saying that we gave India an excuse means that you are already a victim. It means that you already acknowledge that India is an oppressive regime where one simple symbol of protest means that you are now subject to violence, arrest and killing and labels. That means you're living under an oppressive regime. So anyone that says you gave them an excuse to say this, that means you already recognize. When we talk about Bollywood, they're saying, um, there was Ami Virk, who's a Punjabi actor saying, you know, uh, Bollywood actors actually support the farmers protest, but they can't say anything overtly and openly because they will feel ramifications of it. If talking about the farmers, the people that are feeding the country and their basic human rights, again, is cause for you to have some sort of ramifications from the government, from the country which you're operating in, that means you operate and you are you set up your whole Bollywood industry and your whole livelihood in a country that is oppressive. So the future of the farmers protest is partly dependent on how much pressure we can create from the outside in. It is an uphill battle. My page is being suppressed on Instagram. Um, why is it that when it started off in December, there was hundreds, 100,000 likes on one of the posts, there was 20,000 likes on another post, and now I can't even get 1,000. There's a reason for that. And the reason is suppressive. Uh, it's a suppressive regime from top to bottom, from India's billionaires to the prime minister of India, to his whole cabinet, to the billionaires in California, when you talk about Zuckerberg and, and Google and YouTube and all these people. So they're being suppressed very tactically. So create as much content and you, as you can, circulate it, put it on your stories. If you're talking about social media activism, if you're a painter, if you're a, a musician, if you're an actor, 
that is your form of resistance and, and do it to the full extent. Let the people of the world know that this issue is still on the forefront of our minds. And if, and we are creating that, you know, there's people that when they see our signs of the farmers protest, they're honking saying we support farmers. We know what's going on. And that is because we've continued this pressure since December and now it's March heading into April. And this pressure has continued. So the future of the farmers protest depends on us and how much pressure we can create. And to your second question, I'll take 30 seconds. How can Punjab benefit from this? Well, number one, identify that the union leadership that is from Punjab that is leading this protest is going to come back to Punjab and try to win elections. And that's not something that we can allow because these people are tied up with the politicians in Punjab, with the Basels, the people that are partially responsible for these bills to begin with. So those people are not allowed to be in positions of leadership. Our efforts should be to free our political prisoners, to free Deep Siddhu and Lakha Sadana, and give them as much support as we can to let them know that we stand with your message. We know that India is oppressive and we support you in your endeavors. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prabhupada Singh. We have a few more questions before we wrap it up, um, and they're quite interesting. Um, from Anmol, he says, how can we contextualize the Taram Yod uh, Morcha of 1982 and 84 with respect to the current movement in order to help non-marginalized Indians? So he says, Gujaratis, Marathas, uh, and understand how Indian oppression has been a constant in their society. Can you repeat the second half of that question? You cut off a little bit. So he says that, um, how can we understand how Indian oppression has been a constant in their society? So not only the Sikhs, but the Gujaratis, uh, the Gujaratis and the Marathas. And um, you know, how do, how do we learn to contextualize this within the Tanam Yodh Marcha that happened in 1982 and 1984, all the way to 1984? Yeah, yeah, awesome. Great question, because um, it talks about the history, which is what I love to talk about more, because this is not just a farmer's protest. I've said continually, the farmer's protest started back then. And when we talk about marginalized communities, why are there seven active separatist movements in India? When we talk about Assam, when we talk about Nagaland, when we talk about Manipur, there are seven active, including Khalistan, there are seven active separatist movements from India. And the reason isn't just because they're like, oh, you know, one day we wake up and we don't want to be part of India. It's because India is oppressive and India kills minorities and India suppresses minorities and they own the media and they own the narrative. So they'll present their image to the West in a certain way. So when we talk about different communities, I'm not too sure what you mean by Gujarat exactly. There's, I mean, there was, there was a Muslim massacre and we see that the prime minister of India is um, the prime minister and elected into power by whatever means. So they were able to suppress that. There are, act, there are people that have said, it was Narendra Modi who changed our judges. I was gonna be hung because I was in the, the mobs that killed innocent people, innocent Muslims, but it was Modi that got my judges changed. It was Modi that said, you guys have three days to do whatever you want, kill as many people as you want. And on the third day, I'll tell you to stop. And then at that point, stop. So it was government sanctioned, which is why Modi was not allowed to come to the West for a long time for human rights violations. He was banned from coming to the US and now all of a sudden he becomes the prime minister and everyone bends over and rolls out the red carpet for him. So that's not, um, that's not representative of who he is. That's representative of the financial ties that Western countries just have to these types of regimes. If it was in their best interest to take him down, they would. Um, and that's where it's gonna be up to create enough pressure. If if we can put up enough billboards, if we can get enough trucks that say India kills minorities, askindiaoy.com. Askindiaoy.com is a website that talks about India. You know, if we can put this into the public image and we can let people know that this is on the forefront, again, creating that pressure, then this will be an issue that people care about. And it will then leak over into the people that we elect into positions of political power. And once the politicians realize, again, it's not the people in power, it's the power of the people. We are the power of the people. Our message is the power of the people. We like to think that these people set the direction, but it's our lack of education when voting that puts these people to power and begin with. So when we talk about the Tharam, Yodh Morcha, and we talk about what Sanjay Nelson called Sapindra, what I was trying to do a long, long time ago, 
when we talk about the Anandpur Sahib resolution, all these documents talk about basic human rights. They talk about, you know, how our language should be allowed to thrive. They talk about how our economy is based in farming and we feed the country. So we are looking for these basic rights. And what did they do? They showed images of every, all of his supporters saying that these people are violent. They had paid people go around into buses, kill Hindus and say that Sanjay Nelson Khalsa Pindrawale is advocating for the killing of Hindus. They again, tried to make it a religious issue when all his support during the time of the Morcha for the Anandpur Sahib resolution was for, you know, this, uh, for these resolutions to succeed. So oppressed minorities, painting six as terrorists, all the, I mean, six are mandated when they're baptized to carry a karpan, which is a weapon. It's not a weapon to be violent. And it's, that's what Sanjay Nelson Khalsa Pindarwana used to say regularly. A Sikh doesn't have weaponries to be violent. It is, we talk about in Vani, in Salokma Lanawa, So it basically means we don't scare anyone but we're not scared of anyone either. If you come to us trying to oppress us, well, not, we're not gonna turn the other cheek. When you're dealing with violence, you respond with that same type of resistance. So they try to paint him as terrorists and they try to paint him as violent and all the people from that era is violent, but we know better with our education and we know what the Indian government does. They try to paint even the farmers who are sitting on the streets peacefully, you know, under an oppressed, are being painted as violent. So imagine when there was a, a lack of information circulation and when Indian media was setting the whole narrative, when in Operation Blue Star, they picked up all of the foreign media and said, you guys have to leave Punjab and all official reports came from, inside, from the Indian media. Imagine how misrepresented those events are. So India is oppressive. India is not a democracy. They have been oppressing communities for very long. If you don't fall in line with them, they call you violent and they'll paint you as a terrorist. So this is the violence that we're up against. It's not the Nishan side we're up against. It's not Khalistan we're up against. It's not Manipur we're up against. It's against India. And it's against Indian oppression and Indian policies. That's where we currently sit. Uh, thank you. We have, uh, I think, about two questions left and we'll try to, if you'd like to answer them. Um, so Dr. Prabhjot Singh, this is a question from Rani Dasan. Um, are you banned from entering India because of your views? Are you viewed as a Khalistani? Uh, her follow-up question was, uh, was Dita Ravi's arrest an attempt of sending a message of intimidation and suppression to dissenters in India and abroad? Um, I guess she's asking for a little bit of- Yeah, that. yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, um, officially, no, uh, not banned, but we know what happened to Juggi. And we know that he just went there for his wedding and he was picked up and he's been in jail for three years. So I, I don't think you're officially banned until you're picked up and tortured there. So there's there's that aspect of it. And I think um, when we talk about um, the labels that you have, we talk about Ravi Singh, who's a, perhaps the biggest humanitarian in in modern history. Um, him saying that Sanjay Nelson Khalsa Pindrawali should not, did not have to retreat from Operation Blue Star. It is a Sikh's right to defend where they are. If they wanted to arrest him, there was no demands made for him to come out or all this is Indian media trying to justify violence again. So I like to say if they can label him as a terrorist, I'm proud to own that title. So in my opinion, there's, you can say, you can say any separatist movement, you can say Khalistan, you can say whatever you want to say. But again, these people aren't the people that are oppressing you. If you don't want that term to exist, if India didn't want that term to exist, and India didn't want Nagaland to be to exist, or Manipur, or Karbistan, or all these different movements, if they want didn't want these terms to exist, they could have stopped being oppressive. They could shouldn't have killed minorities. They shouldn't allow people currently now in 2021 who are mass murderers to be prime ministers of the country. This tells you how India operates. And a lot of people say, no, 
work through the system, you know, file court cases. You don't think people have filed court cases? Do we think that a court case means anything in India? When we talk about Amit Shah, who's the home minister, one of the highest positions in Modi's government right now, and when judges refuse to pass an order in his favor, he got them changed. And the one judge that said, um, you're not going to get paid. First, they tried to bribe him with $14 million, Judge Loya, and then they got him killed and said it was a heart attack. So these are the people that are currently in power in India. So I would challenge anyone to say, how do minorities survive in India? When the judicial system is against you, when the government is against you, when there are mass murderers that are prime ministers, and now there are billionaires from Western countries tied with those mass murderers who have the same amount, if not more blood on their hands. I would challenge anyone to say, how do we exist in that country? It's only the very, very privileged people in Punjab, in India, that say that there's no discrimination, that say that there's no segregation. It is, um, I have family from Punjab who's from Chandigarh who are, you know, well off. And they're saying, you know, there's, there's really not much. There's no discrimination. Yeah, because it doesn't exist in your world. But for a mass majority of the people that are operating in this way, this is how it exists. This is the reality. And that is India is suppressive. And if you don't shut up, you get killed. And unfortunately for India, six have never been the community to shut up. So this is why we're seeing this amount of opposition. This is why we're seeing this type of resistance. I forgot the second question, but I don't know if you want to get to another one. I'm sure we'll get to another question that we have here. Um, it's um, so the question states that it's been proven that children actually have a huge impact on their parents' political views and morals. India's feeding children and students ideas against the farmers protest in their education system. So how could educators and teachers all over the world um, help this cause? Um, do the opposite, do the opposite. Because, you know, India is a suppressive regime. They're, um, they're gonna say that on January 26th, the Indian flag was disrespected and touched and whatever it might be. This is a symbol of, uh, of disobedience. If you wanna take a camera angle and say that these people are now violent for what they did, and you want to put it in your curriculum and on your tests literally weeks later and saying, what would you do in that situation if terrorists took over the red fort and, you know, disrespected your country? Now, the country of India is believing that these people are violent, that these people are terrorists. Um, the, the, the kids who are now shaping their minds and their ideologies to, to be the youth of this country that comes to the West with these ideologies those people are now being contaminated by the Indian narrative. So what can we do in Western countries is do the opposite. You know, advocate for the proper history to be in history books. You know, Canada does a much better job than, uh, than the US does when it comes to talking about, you know, their history. And even before this event, we did a land acknowledgement, which is phenomenal. And I think that's, that's what happened because a lot of, our countries and a lot of where we are today is on the blood and on the effort of the natives that lived on this land. So, and these people aren't even in our history books. We celebrate Thanksgiving like it was some, you know, great holly jolly holiday, but it was genocide. It was part of a genocide. So we can, we can talk about it all we want, but until we are able to create pressure as educators, as people that are moving up the educational ladder to say that, we are superintendents of districts, or now we are fighting to be on um, city council or on the educational board, or we're gonna be policy makers. Now, these people get to set the direction, and at least have a say into the curriculum. If we can start talking about the correct curriculum, we can somehow in indirectly start to undo some of the damage that India is continuing to, doing, to do for its citizens. So, as educators, as policymakers, whatever it might be. In our classrooms, we are to an extent restricted by the curriculum that we're given. So the logical step would be to talk about how we can influence that curriculum. How, because history is on our side. It's not like we're trying to paint some very one-sided, inaccurate picture of history. These Western countries were based on the genocide of the natives. India was 
colonized, right? And was colonized by the British. Gandhi was it who freed them. He was uh, an element and a person who was propped up on a pedestal to paint Indian independence, but it wasn't him who brought Indian independence. And India is a suppressive regime. There is no freedom of speech there. There is no freedom of press there. We're seeing journalists getting uh, you know, arrested during the farmers' protest, journalists being tortured for talking about the truth during the farmers' protest. Sorry, I just remembered Disha Ravi. Um, do, is it symbolic? I don't think it was symbolic. I think India is just that dumb. Because at a point where all eyes are on you and you're burning pictures of Greta Thunberg, you're going to arrest the, the woman who is part of Greta Thunberg's friends, who's in that circle of people. So, and in a, in a point where the whole world is talking about Nadeep Kaur, you know, another female who was arrested by India and sexually assaulted as a form of silencing and as a, of oppressing. You're going to go and arrest Disha Ravi. So it may be symbolic. I think it's symbolic of how India has operated for a long time. And that is, number one, it's the world's most dangerous place for a female to live by far. Um, it is one of the most unhappiest places to live in the world by far. So it talks about Nadeep Kaur was of, of, of this uh, quote unquote low caste and she was a female. So she had two things against her and she was arrested and sexually assaulted as a form of silencing. And all of our foreign ministers are somehow silent about that. Even though that did happen, she can tell you it happened. So what's happening is uh, Sonia Mann and these different people from India are saying, you know, she wasn't sexually assaulted. I visited her in jail. All these people are politicians. All these people are playing the narrative. So it wasn't symbolic to to let people, it may have been symbolic to let people know to shut up, but it was symbolic of the oppression that number one, being a female in India entails. And with Nadeep Kaur, it was specifically being a female from what they consider a low caste and the repercussions, consequences and ramifications of that. So I wanted to thank you so much, Dr. Singh. You know, it was really an honor to have you join us for our first event in the series. And, and honestly, a, a, a true blessing to have us begin this work in this way. Um, I just wanna, you know, again, invite you um, hopefully uh, for an in-person conference once, you know, um, life is safe again. Um, and I, I truly wanna thank you for joining us today. And, you know, the point of this lecture was to create this platform to work through a very useful trajectory of thoughts to think about and then to put into action as well. Um, and you've, you've really expressed points that we have to consider seriously, especially in terms of um, what you talked about in terms of, you know, the collective liberation, um, in terms of abolition, in uh, surrounding issues of censorship and the role of diaspora specifically in supporting the protesters and speaking up against the injustices that we see. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hopefully meeting you guys in person one day. Yes, Dr. Singh, thank you so much for the seva um, and being our first speaker to open up the platform. I'm sure Sikhs in the diaspora are, are quite thankful for today's lecture and your time. Um, it was quite in, uh, insightful. I, I certainly learned a lot and your passion actually inspires me in my own personal journey, journey as an educator. So thank you for that. Um, we obviously decided to have this lecture as our first lecture because there is this looming fear of genocide and uh, kind of a reenactment of 1984. So we took it quite seriously. And, we're glad that you were able to open it up for us. Uh, going forward, of course, we will be hosting a, a wide variety of lectures that relate to social justice issues with, within our respective communities. And as Malcolm X once said, uh, a new world order is in the making and it's up to us to make our rightful place in it. So uh, thank you for helping us through this process as well. Absolutely, guys, thank you so much. Um, we also want to thank um, everyone for attending, um, and we just kind of want to remind you to check out our online database um, that launched early this week, where we feature artists, creators, academic work, and community resources free of cost. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Of of thank you, guys. We'll see you. Bye. Bye.